Well, good morning, everybody. Here's my plan for today's forecast video. We're going to talk about the continued severe weather threat uh, today, tomorrow, into Sunday across the midsection of the United States. We're also going to look at where the extremely heavy rains could be out of the next couple of systems as well. We'll then push this into a bit of a discussion about the temperature pattern. Some of the models took a little bit of a colder look uh, in the pattern here for the Canadian prairie and parts of the northern plains of the United States. And we've been talking about that deeper trough that could show up over the northeast once we get out there to May 7th, 8th, and 9th and where that could land of frost. We'll take a close look at that as well. Then my plan to finish this is I'm going to give you another look at May based on what I've got right now. And I, I kind of want to take a different approach with the long range update today. And that is, I kind of want to step into a scenario that I haven't considered yet. And I want to talk about maybe the west versus the east and a risk of a high over low setup given longer term trends. And at the very end of this, we're going to talk about some uh, stuff going on internationally, including some large wildfires that are down here in Western Australia. Uh, just something to kind of take a look at. So let's come back to our satellite data from yesterday and just show you the storm system. This is the first of the two waves that are coming through the country. And just as we see the sunset, uh, multiple complexes of very large storms here. But again, my eye is always drawn to just where that dry line is gonna be. Now these storms did deliver some rain into parts of western Kansas, as you can see here, uh, but there was a large section of, of the dry area of Kansas we've been discussing so many times now that has been missed by some of this precipitation. Out ahead of it, very heavy rain coming into parts of Missouri already, uh, into Arkansas as well, and into Oklahoma where this morning we're watching a line of severe storms go through. But once again, we saw a pretty uh, massive dust storm coming out of New Mexico into western Texas, and I zoomed in there to have a closer look at it. So not only can you see the deep convection to the north, which is always just amazing to look at on this satellite imagery, but we can see wildfire activity in Mexico. We can see the, the dust and mixing in with some of the smoke here coming out of New Mexico into Texas. And it's really quite evident just as the sun sets last night. So where that dry line ended up kind of curling its way around to was up here in this part of western Kansas delivering some... Uh, some much needed rain to some places. I did want to show you a little farther to the north just to get a good look at that. those storms coming out of Colorado into western Kansas. I mean, this has got to be one of the just most amazing places to watch storms on the face of the earth here. And uh, just some neat features in this. You can see this boundary tucked away in through here. And maybe we could spend hours just walking through all of the amazing meteorology that shows up on this high resolution satellite data, including look at these anvil shadows just show you how deep into the atmosphere these make it. Well, the net effect of all of this is we had some severe weather, of course, with that rain. Uh, almost 100 reports of severe weather, most of this coming from hail. There were five tornado reports, including, I'm not sure if you saw this in the news, but the one over here in Salt Lake City uh, that was really impressive to see. So deeper convection in the mountains uh, is there as well. Uh, when I look back on it, though, just showing you some of the maximum estimated hail size data. We kind of zoom in here in the midsection of the country. We saw several of these uh, storms in parts of western Kansas putting down baseball size hail yesterday and doing quite a bit of damage as a result. Total rainfall out of this though, um, very heavy into parts of western Kansas, Colorado. Then take a look at this large area over the last three days in Nebraska. Uh, quite decent moisture. And then the heavy rains coming into eastern Kansas sliding down into Missouri. So this is the area that I mentioned here that uh, has still a couple more chances of getting very heavy rainfall coming through. And there are storms in that general vicinity this morning. Some live lightning data here just kind of shows us a few different complexes of storms. We continue to monitor into the early morning hours ahead of sunrise. And we're keeping a close eye early this morning on the squall line down here in parts of Oklahoma. That one is severe warned at the moment. So the last 18 hours or so, let's just take a quick look at what the radar's got. And again, early this morning, I'm keeping a close eye on this storm system right here, rolling through this part of southeastern Oklahoma as producing uh, the severe weather. Okay, for the rest of today, our attention's going to go back later this afternoon uh, to parts of eastern Nebraska, again, eastern Kansas, Missouri, and Iowa. And we have a pretty large area in through here of enhanced risk. You can kind of see the scale on the bottom. This is, uh, once again, the tornado, hail, and straight line wind damage uh, risk in this particular region. I'm going to show it to you by going to the high resolution rapid refresh model. We're going to start this off at 6 a.m. This only runs out 36 hours. 
But what we're going to see is the morning rains kind of clearing over to the Mississippi River into Illinois, coming uh, into parts of Missouri, more into Missouri here. The backside of this curls around, see the heavy precipitation here. And of course, we still have more in the deeper trough in the western mountains. But this is noon today getting into this evening. So 4 to 5 o'clock, keep a close eye right in through here for the chance of isolated rotating storms. Of course, we call those supercells uh, starting to blow up here kind of in the fresh air on the back side. I say fresh. What I mean by that is we clear this out from cloud. We get some sun beating down on this before the front wipes through. We've got the wind shear profile. We've got the additional heating from the day. And that's what allows these storms to pop when they do. Now, the model just gives us an idea, right? It's not going to say that there will be an exact storm right here at this time. We're just trying to use the model to see when and where they're coming through. Meanwhile, this evening, the main upper level front, which is way out here over parts of Illinois and Missouri, continues to deliver very heavy rains into those areas. And that pushes east in the overnight and gets into Indiana by Saturday morning, as you can see. And this just all wraps itself up into this broader low that's going toward, um, you know, eventually toward Minnesota and Wisconsin. By the time we get into Saturday, this is going to set us up with a very um, complex next system. And what I mean by that is it's going to give us some upslope flow into the Rockies, which means this is going to be snow. There'll be some convective snow into the interior. And we're going to watch. This is only through 1 o'clock on Saturday, but we're going to watch again this area open up to severe storms because the wind field at that time looks something like this. So the large high that's over the east tomorrow just feeds this Gulf moisture. The dry line sitting somewhere a bit in through here. There's even a bit of a deformation zone a bit farther to the north. And what that's providing is the flow that's going to come out of the east, piling right up here into you know this part of the front range of the Rocky Mountains. You step up in the atmosphere. The low-level jet by mid-afternoon tomorrow is cranking into this area. And if we go even up higher, let's call this all the way up to 250. This is jet stream level. We have that kind of classic setup. There's the trough coming over the mountains. It's almost oriented straight north-south. There's a subtropical bit of the jet to the south of it. And all of this is going to lead to some pretty rapid upper-level divergence supporting a surface low. And at the same time, a good pull on gulf heat and moisture, which is why we've got the severe weather risk on Saturday over a much broader area. So the enhanced risk stretches from Texas all the way to Iowa and all the states in between. And the reason why we've got this connected up here into parts of lower Michigan is because the other system that's curling its way up in Ontario leaves a front on which this all links. So it's a cold front here, switches over to a warm front there, and then comes back into the low that you'll see curling up here into parts of Kansas and Nebraska coming out of Colorado. Once we get to the 28th, we see that that area of severe weather risk just moves a bit farther uh, to the east, and that's about it. Day four and beyond, we are right now seeing major severe weather threat because as we've been talking about all week, these systems are lifting through the country. They're not digging into the southeast. So let's go to the high res NAM and just get a good look at what it says on this pattern. Here's the first system. We've seen this in the high res rapid refresh model, the HRRR. So what we need to do is get our way out here into Saturday. Now watch right here. Here's the next low coming out of Colorado. See the upslope snow there? Where this gets down, I mean, this is going to be a very tough forecast if you're in Colorado trying to figure out where the snow line is going to be in the, in the front range. But what we're going to watch is this is 9 a.m. Saturday, getting into Saturday afternoon and evening. See the storms again erupting right in this corridor on Saturday evening and pressing east. Now you can see the front I mentioned linking everything up. See it? So this is the front that's cold front here, a warm front there, links up to the other system. There'll be a dry line that comes into this. There'll also be an upper level front out ahead of it. And on the very back side, there'll be a cold front that sneaks in. There's really four fronts with this system. So this is through early morning on Sunday, playing out through Sunday midday. Take a look at that. Chance of snow on the back side of this. And this run goes out to 1 p.m. on Sunday Central Time. So these are the next two lows that are coming through. And we're expecting quite a bit of precipitation out of these and the risk of severe storms today, tomorrow, and in the day on Sunday. Uh, if we take a look at the snow side of it, just kind of zooming in here on the west, this is the chance of grabbing two inches out of this. 
And again, the trickiest forecast I think is going to be right here along the front range. How high up in elevation do you have to go to get this snow? I did not take a very close look at this this morning. This is the only graphic I'm focusing on here. But if I step this up to four inches and eight inches, I mean, there's the potential right away as you start to climb the elevation here of getting extremely heavy snow. So it's going to be quite tricky uh, in this area. All right, uh, all hazards weather map. We've got the winter weather advisories, the winter storm watches, even some winter storm warnings up here between the border of Idaho and Montana. Uh, we have red flag warning. Here is the severe thunderstorm watch and tornado watch area with the severe thunderstorm warnings this morning right through here. We have the cold still exiting east again today. So the frost and freeze advisories uh, that are out in this side of the country. And I wanna talk to you more about this same area uh, about what two weeks from now as well uh, not quite two weeks a little less than two weeks about 10 to 12 days and why i'm concerned about that is because of this upper level height pattern so wave one coming out the deeper wave two there it is on saturday that's the one that's kicking off the severe weather here that one again lifts goes right over parts of uh, you know uh, of minnesota and then into early next week, this is uh, Monday, Tuesday, deep trough digging into the northwest. We'll take a look at the total precip there. And it just kind of lingers in this area, suggesting that we're going to have some colder air coming in on the back side of this as we watch these lows kind of skirt along the U.S.-Canada border. May 3rd, uh, interestingly enough, the latest run from the artificial intelligence has kind of taken this trough back into the central U.S., uh, it has been as far north as parts of Alberta. At one point, it was coming out down here in Texas. It's been consistent with producing it. It's just the placements changed a lot. And if this does sweep through, uh, you know, next Friday, it is something to be on the lookout for for the risk of strong, severe storms once again in the midsection of the country. But it's after this that I'm curious about because May 5th, 6th, 7th, and 8th, right through there, we notice we've got this kind of high over low setup and that's a that is a blocking style pattern i don't believe the pattern is blocked in other words it's not going to stay like this for seven to ten days but it is once again dropping a trough we've now seen all week long in the forecast dropping this trough around may 8th now the models at this point are not fully picking up on the uh, big um frost event uh, it, I'm just going to tell you, though, this will bring in, if it does manifest itself, some colder air. What's interesting is it's really only showing up in the artificial intelligence forecasting system. So let's put it to the test again and just see if it really manifests itself out there around May 8th. Um, I just want to show you that if we go to the European Ensemble, you know, it's out here. So that, that is a difference, a significant difference we have to be thinking about. Also, the European Ensemble is going to show a bit of a drier look in the midsection of the country getting out there to the end of week two. And the reason for that is just kind of broader ridging. And if, if you were to take this and bring it here, then we'd be talking about more storm systems. But it looks like we might get a break coming in this pattern once we get past the first, I don't know, four or five days of May uh, to kind of open things up to a lot of, I think, warmth in the midsection of the country with the cooler risks being here and uh, I think planting time frame. So given that as a setup, before I show you the multi-model precip, can we just check in on where we've been recently with precipitation? This is the month to date information, and this is through 7 a.m. on the 25th, right? So we're, we're waiting to get all of yesterday's data into all of this. And again, it shows us those areas that have really missed out on so much precipitation which is why the extremely heavy rainfall that's forecast in this area and around it is critical. This seems to be the area that even though we see some hints that rain gets into that region, it seems to continue to get missed as we watch the atmosphere just draw very dry, dusty, and now smoky air out of Mexico into this side of, um, you know, of our southern and western plains. Uh, in addition to this, take a look at how drier we've been in the Pacific Northwest. You know that we finished the season with... I would just say less than normal snowpack in a lot of the mountains, uh, just based on some of the data I have. And uh, therefore, a little bit drier look going forward. It's just something I want to think about and, and make sure I'm keeping track of. And then you can also see parts of Virginia, North Carolina that have been on the drier side of this as well. Newest drought monitor released yesterday did expand the abnormally dry region in North Carolina. 
uh, but it did back off a bit and showed some drought relief in parts of the Western Corn Belt here. In fact, if you just take a look at the change map, this is just the one week change map that should come up here. There it is. We had a one class improvement in the drought and everywhere that you see this shade. But where the heavy rains are coming in, this will improve the next drought monitor here. But we have another class degradation in southwestern Kansas and parts of central Kansas as well, just to kind of point out a few areas. On the soil moisture side of things, this is the latest 40 centimeter or 16 inch soil moisture data. And if we step this up now to the, or down, I guess, to the 100 centimeter or 40 inch, this is what we see. So I just want to keep providing you with these maps. We've kind of continued the narrative on them all spring. We're just getting the latest kind of updates here. All right, precipitation coming in. Uh, for some reason this morning, my download of the AIFS, the Artificial Intelligence Forecasting System from the European model, didn't come in. I started to rerun it at about 4, 4.30 this morning. It was still running by the time I um, hit record this morning. So something's up with their delivery. But Weatherbell got it, so I don't know. Maybe they have a better connection than I do. Uh, but again, this is the next seven days where they're calling for precip. And just to match up their color bars, you can see down here, this is the two to four inch range in terms of total precipitation from the AIFS. Let's go now over to my maps. This is from the National Blend of Models this morning. Not quite as aggressive on those huge rainfall amounts, but still some chances in here of going well over three inches of rain out of this setup. Again, storms coming through right now, adding to some of that. If we then go to the WPC, this is their newest seven day forecast on total precipitation. And again, we just see, keep seeing in all of these forecasts, these areas that seem to be missing out on the precipitation that would normally in spring be receiving it. It is less common for heavy rains to be coming into the west this time of year. Uh, so just a reason why I kind of stay east of the Rocky Mountains here overall. And then our last two models, this is the European seven day forecast, and this is the GFS. So um, again, we're gonna get these all stacked up and lined up for you so you can see them anytime you want on agweather.com as I continue to kind of modify that site. I'll spend the next, I think, four weeks going over that uh, and, uh, and getting that ready for you. All right, what I wanna show you next is some probability numbers. So this is the chance of getting an inch as we work our way into the weekend. So that's just over the weekend who has the best chance at getting an inch. So this is by Sunday evening. If we add onto this all the way through that system that comes through May 3rd, 2nd, 3rd, we now see a pretty broad area that has a high probability of an inch. Now we may have got a new model run and we're like, oh good, we didn't just yet. Uh, this is the chance of getting two inches out of this setup. So we're just looking for these really wet areas and we can then compare and contrast that to the drier areas over the next week. If we stretch this out even farther, let's go out 10 days. This is what we're looking at in terms of the chances of staying under a half inch over the next 10 days. And again, I, I know I sound like a bit of a broken record, but this area continues to concern me. I know it is the high desert plains, but just the fact that we've not seen moisture get into this area just is something I want to think about going forward. And again, it's this region too, and the southeast. And the southeast has time, but we need to start to see the pattern uh, reinvigorate with precipitation as we get into May into that area uh, while they're getting this kind of extended drier look. Let's go ahead and look at the uh, temperature forecast because this is going to influence what I think you're about to see next when I compare the GFS to the European. The next five days on the ECMWF, this is the operational run looking at temperature anomalies compared to day five through 10 really begins to show some colder air coming in through here. And why I'm showing you this is because I have a feeling that we're not quite done with snow in our more northerly latitudes. And to show you that, let's compare the GFS on the left to the European on the right. Okay, we've looked at these two systems pretty carefully. There's one, there's the one on Saturday into Sunday, and then here we get into early next week. Now what's interesting about early next week is there's a low, remember, on the kind of the, the 30th into the 1st that kind of sneaks along the U.S.-Canada border. Can you see it right in through here? There's that low. And it drops a front that comes through the Midwest. This is early next Wednesday morning. Brings another chance at some rain. That front will linger right in through this area, which is why you saw on the one week forecast, this is this region that continues to get hit. So your next big chance comes mid to late next week with heavy rain in this area as well. 
This is the time frame I'm also concerned about on the second and third of the potential for a system that sneaks through giving us a severe weather look in the midsection of the country. I don't think the models have it timed right yet, but uh, this is what you've currently got out to the third. Now just let me rock you back and forth here. And I'm looking primarily at where there's some blue. And you notice coming in through Montana next Thursday into Friday, there's some cold air that sneaks in through here. And the GFS, okay, take it for what it is, is trying to drop some snow. A little bit later in the forecast, this would be next Saturday the 4th, the European gets in on this. It's a little bit different timing, of course, as they always are, but it's suggesting there's enough cold air in there for some snow in Montana, and you can still see there's one more system, the third, fourth, fifth, that the models are trying to kick out here to bring in the risk of some, um, you know, some, some uh, adverse weather. But in 10 days, we've got multiple chances of heavy rain in this area, which is why I should do those probability maps a moment ago. All right, what about week two? When we get past that, I think the European model's got the right solution. Notice that it's showing, um, it's showing something where the pattern's doing this. And I think that's why we're starting to get a little bit more normal precipitation, a little bit on the drier side here uh, overall. But at the same time, uh, you can see that it's trying to keep parts of the south wet, maybe parts of the southeast wet as well. That would be out there week two, which gets us all that to May the 10th now. So I've got to keep an eye on this. This is the 51 member ensemble. It is not the same as the GFS solution, as you see here. The GFS has more of a persistence bias in its forecast. In other words, what we're getting right now, it's just trying to keep that pattern alive uh, and going, as you can see here. And to be honest, the CPC has kind of got a similar outlook. All right. So watch the trend in this over the weekend. This is all on agweather.com. This is the national report site. So if you just go to that ag-wx.com forward slash national underscore report, you get all these maps kind of stacked up. And I, I hope I could have put them in a useful uh, format for you. Okay, let's talk about temperature since I just scrolled down to it here. A couple of maps to get us acquainted with where we've been. These are the temperature ranks since April 1. And uh, this morning, I changed over my code to start showing uh, for GDD accumulations since April 1. So looking at this, we've been a bit cooler in Florida, cooler in the west, cooler in the southwest. And it kind of reflects now in the latest update on this map. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't change the date on this. Ignore that February 1. This is April 1 when I started this. I just didn't change the title date. And um, it's again showing accumulated GDDs. Uh, compared to average. So it's a base of 50, max 86. That's a corn calculation. We're just trying to see where there has been some early heat and compare it to historical averages. So we'll keep you updated on this map as we progress through the season. All right, temperatures now though. Over the next seven days, this is our frost risk. And it's day eight, nine, 10, and 11. I'll be concerned about again, starting with cooler here, moving into the north uh, east. I'm not set on it, but I just want to let you know I'm thinking about it. Let's blow this up and have a good look at our min temperatures. These are this morning's forecast min temperatures. This is getting into Saturday morning, Sunday morning. So again, frost risk up here. We're going to now get into Monday morning. Two, well, by the way, Monday. See the cool air coming down here. This was now getting into Tuesday of next week. Cool air coming in once again to the Pacific Northwest. We're going to have some patchy frost risk out of this. And as we go into Wednesday, keep an eye in this area next week. That's the first. Getting into the second, we're just going to see another round of cold air kind of sneaking across the northern tier of the United States. On the high temperature side of it, where the deep trough lives in the west, that's why we've got cooler conditions here. This is Saturday. Getting into Sunday, look at the back side of that low. A lot of cold air here on the back side of this. Getting into Monday and Tuesday, that's when the colder air enters the northwest again playing out to next Wednesday and Thursday. Now, what I'm concerned about <clears throat> is following this. On, <clears throat> excuse me, Friday morning, the European model is trying to drop a frost line here. That's next Friday morning. And if I shrink that so I can get the scroll bar, this is what they're doing Saturday morning. And if we go all the way out here to Sunday morning, this is, look at this in Montana. I remember this is when the European wanted to drop snow in Montana as well. But I'm just looking for any late shots at colder air 
And if there's been one spot in this country that has had a wild ride on temperatures, it's got to be Montana. I cannot believe the swings we've seen, 80 degree plus swings in temperatures in the span of a week in Montana. I know some of you watching this Montana are like, yeah, that's what it does here. But I mean, from Illinois, those kind of swings in temperatures are much, much less uh, common uh, to see. So it's always amazing just to check into that. When you blend it all together, though, and use the GFS ensemble, so this is a 31-member ensemble, we do see the day 5 through 10 cooler risk in this area and in the northwest, but not it's not showing up as strongly as you saw in the individual runs. And by day 10 through 15, the GFS just continues with this overall mild look to it. It is important to note that the European ensemble also has that cooler you know, area showing up here day 5 through 10. But out to day 10 through 15, it's just important to note that they're not showing the strong warmth in this area. And this is where the artificial intelligence is trying to drop the risk of some cooler weather. I don't see a frost yet. I don't. It's not there. But we have to be aware of the fact that that trough could do something in this area to bring in an early morning chance at a frost. I'm going to guess sometime around the morning of the 8th of May, maybe the 9th. And there, you can start to see its effect going out there when we look at the, the five-day stretch ending on the 10th. All right, so let's, let's get out here and look a little bit longer range. I've been showing you all week just the European model's outlook for May. And it's come back to this solution multiple times. It's trying to keep a pretty stormy corridor through the midsection of the country and drier. Not dry, but drier in this area. Uh, interesting enough, comparing that to what the CPC released on Friday, not the same scenario, right? This wet look that they've put down here is not consistent with the new European forecast. And that's okay. There can be differences. We just have to explain why. And I wonder if when the CPC created their forecast, because they use models, they also use history, they use everything at their disposal. I just kind of wonder if they were looking back at some of the analogs, knowing that typically coming out of El Nino, like we are, we tend to get a wet, wetter go here and drier in the interior. So I think that their precipitation forecast does match a bit more with history than it does maybe with the current model runs. Now, um, one thing to think about here is if we come back to the European model and flip this over to temperatures, 30-day outlook, um, the cooler conditions in the Northwest, I certainly think we're going to be dealing with that in the near term coming back. But um, history would say, and so does the CPC, that we might get into some really warm conditions in the Northwest, just something to be paying attention to once we get fully into the month of May. All right, with all of that, I want to now go back to summer. And I'm going to show you two different forecasts. If we just keep all those analog years, the ones I keep showing you, they're always the ones that go from El Nino winter to La Nina by summer or fall. This is what they all look like stitched together. And in the last two weeks, I've been trying to call this into question, just saying, is this really what we're going to get into? You know, much above average temperatures here, mostly with warm overnight lows, but looking like a hotter summer. And the drought risk being in one of these three areas. That's, these are the three areas that I, I focused on in February and in March and now in April as being the, the risky areas. I then told you about a week and a half ago, I, I've not convinced myself that this is the case. And it is certainly against the longer term models, like what we just got from the CPC, that that's not what I just showed you is not where the risk is going to be. And this is their May, June, July outlook for precipitation wet here. They're going to try to bridge the droughts between Mexico and Canada by the time we get into uh, June, July, August. So this is a Western Plains, Central Plains, Rocky Mountain drought issue wet in the southeast up the east coast. <clears throat> Excuse me. And this is the July, August, September, which means mid to late summer migration of the dry conditions into the Western Corn Belt out of the plains. And the, you've seen it multiple times, what the European model is suggesting. This is almost exactly what the NMME is looking at. Um, and so it's not consistent. There's no consistent picture with all of this. So I alluded to at the beginning of this video, I don't know, 25 minutes ago, that I wanted to talk about the scenario that I've not covered. And that scenario is this. I'm going to show you that if you look back to 1990, and I just picked 1990 as a starting point, and going all the way to 2023, this is 33 years of data, that the longer term trend for summer, June through August, if we just said, what has the trend been for the last 33 years? 
the trend has actually been more toward Western U.S. ridging. In fact, not just that, but kind of Western U.S. blocking in summer, high over low. With Bermuda high being stronger, farther here, farther to the north here, excuse me. That's what the longer term trend has suggested, that more often than not, we get a blocking split pattern over the west. I have not mentioned that at all in my long range because it's not been there. We've been mostly focused on could we get ridging in the south? Could we get it in the southern plains? Or could it be in the Midwest because of deep troughs in the Gulf of Alaska? But the one scenario I've not asked myself about is, is it possible that we get into a Western US split flow setup? And that honestly is the most dangerous in my opinion. And why it's most dangerous is because of this. If you look over that same time period, because of this flow, this is actually what our precipitation, anomalous precipitation has looked like. We've been favoring Western Canada drought. We've been favoring an active corridor in through here of wetter than average conditions, primarily on Northwest summer flow and big squall lines that roll through the country, something like this. Ah, sorry, just keep, <laughs> try that again, there we go. Just rolling through the country like that with dry conditions spreading here. And unfortunately, with heat that comes into this pattern, whenever you put a big blocking high over low over the Northwest, we tend to get a major Western wildfire threat. Now, last year, we didn't have that. Last year was an entirely different setup. And I, I just, you have to question, like, is there a chance we go to this despite what's going on with El Nino? In other words, could you override the big climate drivers like what El Nino's transition to La Nina is going to look like and just land yourself here? Absolutely. Remember, at any given time, now this is important to listen to, at any given month of the year, the highest correlation coefficient with a weather pattern and, uh, and El Nino or La Nina, and so, is like 0.3 to minus 0.3. It's not 0.8 or 0.9. So I just want to investigate this and think about this as a possible scenario. And I'm going to tell you why I think it's the most risky. This right here, this graph is what I'm concerned about. It shows all these Western states. Okay. And I'm looking at their NDVI value. So this is basically how healthy does the vegetation look right now. And through mid-April, it's the highest in the last 20 years. If we get into a scenario where split flow shows up in early June, we will get into a positive feedback cycle to bring in heat, high pressure, and drought. You know what that'll also change? The southwest monsoon, which we talked about earlier this week. Okay, and, and that my biggest concern and why this is a dangerous scenario is we've had two years of vegetative growth following two massive winters of big snows in places in the west. Plus, remember last year was wet throughout the West. We had a lot of summer thunderstorm activity. And I just worry that if you get hot and dry early, that vegetation, you know what can happen to it. And then we could work our way into what could be, if the pattern favors split flow in the West, a very active wildfire season. I don't know. I'm just telling you what I'm concerned about. So think on that with me and we'll keep investigating it. But I got to finish up with a couple of things here. South America. The heat, as we've been talking about, is coming on. This is autumn heat, though. This is not midsummer heat, but it is warmer than average. And as we've been discussing, the precipitation pattern here is one where we're not expecting. This is an early slowdown of the monsoon. Just through the next 7 to 10 days, there are places in through here that may pick up no rain. No rain at all while there's flooding in southern Brazil. That's the same story we've carried all, all week. To finish this out, I want to give you kind of an international view. This is what we're looking at globally in terms of the next 10 days on precipitation. And pause it. You'll see the same areas I talked about all week, just kind of continuing the patterns we've been discussing. But these rains right down here could be absolutely critical into parts of Western Australia because on satellite, again, let's get this playing here. We've watched these bushfires right down here, uh, you know, way down in the south, very southwestern corner of uh, Australia. And on, sorry, I moved the cursor. On satellite, these are, this is a lot of wildfire smoke. And I just want to bring your attention to just something happened internationally. All right, that's all I got for you this week. Have a good weekend. We'll pick this up on Monday. Thanks.